Alexia, hello and good evening. Thanks for joining us. I'm Brenda LaPaul and you're watching News at 10. Making the headlines tonight. Government agrees to abolish mandatory death penalty. Fifteen Malaysians confirmed involved in Musdalifa bus crash. The government has agreed to abolish the mandatory death penalty and substitute it with other sentences which are subject to the discretion of the court. Minister and the Prime Minister's Department of Parliament and Law, Dr. Sri Dr. Wan Junaidi Tuanku Jafar, said the decision was reached after he presented the report on substitute sentences for the mandatory death penalty at the Cabinet meeting last Wednesday. In a statement released today, Dr. Sri Dr. Wan Junaidi said the government has also agreed in principle to accept and take note of the recommendations made by the special committee on substitute sentences for the mandatory death penalty as explained in the report. He said the cabinet also agreed that further study be carried out on the proposed substitute sentences for 11 offences carrying the mandatory death penalty, one of which is under Section 39B of the Dangerous Drugs Act 1952, Act 234, and 22 offences carrying the death penalty, but with the discretion of the court. The study will be carried out in collaboration with the Attorney General's Chambers, the Legal Affairs Division of the Prime Minister's Department and other relevant ministries and departments. He said the move is highly significant to ensure that all amendments to the relevant laws would take into account the principles of proportionality and the constitutionality of any proposal made to the government later. In a related development, Dr. Sri Dr. Wan Junaidi revealed that the government will also carry out a feasibility study on the direction of the criminal justice system in the country, such as having pre-sentencing procedures, a sentencing council and a sentencing guideline. Also to be studied is the setting up of a law commission, prison reform and the execution of sentences based on restorative justice. According to the minister, the decision on this matter shows the government's emphasis on ensuring the rights of all parties are protected and guaranteed, thus reflecting the transparency of the country's leadership in improving the country's criminal justice system. And in response to Dato Sri Dr. Wan Junaidi's statement, Prime Minister Dato Sri Isma Sabiyakum also explained that the death penalty will remain and not be abolished. And the change is only in the fact that judges are now given discretion in sentencing. With the decision, he said judges will no longer be bound by the word mandatory, which had left them with no choice but to impose a death penalty on criminal offenders as provided by law, such as in drug trafficking cases. Kita berpandangan bahawa setiap manusia ini perlu diberikan peluang kedua untuk hidup. Jadi hakim ada dua pilihan. Kalau dia rasakan orang itu memang penjenayah tegak, memang mengedah dadah yang menyebabkan beratus ribu orang mati, dia hukum mati. Boleh. Dia dibenarkan untuk menjatuhkan hukuman mati. Tetapi kalau dia rasa dari segi budi bicara dia, dia kata dia nak beri hukuman seumur hidup lah dengan sebat sekali. Jadi dia kata dia boleh binda hukuman mandatory itu kepada hukuman yang lebih ringan. The Premier was met after officiating the Peninsula Malaysia Orang Asli Association's annual general meeting in Burra, Pahang today. On the issue of gazetting the Orang Asli settlement's land, Dr. Sri Masari said that of the total, that a total of 216 settlements had been gazetted thus far, 427 more were in the application stage and 117 had yet to submit their applications. In addition, he said the Orang Asli Welfare Department would be asked to go down to the field to meet chiefs of villages that had not yet applied. Jadi sebagian besarnya telah separuh, hampir separuh telah pun diwartakan dan telah pun dirumuskan. Cuma yang saya sebutkan tadi bahawa banyak perkampungan-perkampungan serpihan di 
kalangan daripada perkampungan asal. Kita fokus di dalam senarai di bawah Jakwa, Jabatan Kemajuan Orang Asli. Semuanya kampung-kampung yang tersenarai adalah kampung-kampung asal. The Prime Minister also hoped that Tok Batin or village chiefs could advise the community not to just move out or open a new village where there is no application for gazetting which makes it difficult for the government to provide appropriate assistance. Yang di Pertuan Agong Al-Sultan Abdullah, Raya Tudin Al-Mustafa Bila Shah and Raja Pemaisri Agong Tunku Haja Azizah Aminah Maimunah Iskandaria today attended the Trooping of Colours at Dataran Pahlawan Negara in Putrajaya. When their majesties arrived at 8.30am, the Negaraku National Anthem was played by the Combined Malaysian Armed Forces ATM Central Band. Then... Five ATM helicopters bearing the Jalugamilang national flag as well as a flag of the ATM, Royal Malaysian Air Force TUDM, Royal Malaysian Navy TLDM and Army performed a fly pass overhead. Simultaneously, a 21-gun salute was fired by the 41st Battery Royal Artillery Regiment. Al Sultan Abdullah, Inspector of the Guard of Honor, mounted by 57 officers and 847 personnel from three ATM wings, led by the commanding officer of the 18th Battalion of the Royal Malay Regiment, Lieutenant Colonel Muhammad Fazli Muhammad Yassin. Then the ATM Central Band led the trooping the colors of the Yang Dipatuan Agung in slow and quick march tempo. Five colours were paraded at the ceremony, namely those of the Royal Malay Regiment, Royal Ranger Regiment, Royal Armoured Corps, Royal Malaysian Navy and Royal Malaysian Air Force. In yet to come, Air Asia committed to resolve all refund requests due to pandemic. Stay with us. But first, the government still has sufficient funds to continue to provide fuel subsidy to the people despite rising global crude oil prices. Finance Minister Tengku Datu Sri Zafrul Tengku Abdulaziz said the government still has enough money and will continue to support the people in terms of protecting their livelihoods, especially that of the vulnerable groups. Elaborating further, Tengku Datu Sri Zafrul said the amount of subsidies for this year is expected to reach 70 billion ringgit and the fuel subsidy may reach 30 billion ringgit. He further noted that last month, the fuel subsidy already reached 5 billion ringgit a month. Tetapi kerajaan akan terus memantau keadaan harga minyak ini di mana kita perlulah melihat apakah uh, plan jangka masa panjang uh, di mana salah satu caranya ialah untuk melaksanakan uh, uh, harga minyak ini dengan lebih bersasar. The minister also said the government has no intention of asking for an additional dividend from Petronas to bear the subsidy at the moment. In terms of the government's revenue, he said, it has also increased although the growth is not as high as the increase in subsidy. He added the government will continue to monitor the situation as this is not only a phenomenon in Malaysia but also at the global level. The Ministry of Finance, MOF, is confident that both the public and private sectors will play their respective roles and contribute to the success of Malaysia's sustainability efforts and goals moving forward. Finance Minister Tengku Datu Sri Zafrul Abdulaziz said it is encouraging to see government-linked companies, GLCs, embrace the sustainability agenda by incorporating environmental, social and governance, ESG, into their core strategies and embedding it throughout their operations and Corporate Social Responsibility, CSR, initiatives. Tunku Datus Rizafrul said the government's position for 2023 remains firm in terms of enabling the implementation of ESG-focused development projects and programs. These GLCs contribute to the mainstream of ESG uh, by serving as role models uh, and the hope is you know, catalyzing a change within uh, their respective ecosystems and encouraging the role of corporate Malaysia to consider how they behave and how their actions uh, can affect the communities uh, and also the environment uh, within in which uh, they operate. 
He said this in his closing remarks at the launch of Kazana Sustainability Framework and Targets today. Tengu Datusri Zafrul said the ministry has outlined a few key priorities in the recently announced budget 2023 pre-budget statement, including Malaysia's strategic transition from the current recovery phase to longer-term reforms. This is said include facilitating better income opportunities and improved holistic well-being in order to achieve Keluarga Malaysia's vision of a more inclusive and sustainable development. With an initial contribution of 20 million ringgit, he said this major funding collaboration demonstrates strong commitment to incorporating SDG principles into Malaysia's national development plans and policies, while also being transparent on the fund's utilisation. Meanwhile, the goods and services tax GST will be improved in terms of the efficiency of its reimbursement process, business compliance level as well as overall administration if the government decides to reintroduce the tax. Finance Minister Tanku Datu Sri Zafrul Abdul Aziz said improvements will also be made to prevent any confusion in the classification of taxable versus non-taxable goods and to enhance the skills of government officials. Any new taxation system, according to Tanku Datus Sri Zafrul, also needs to be approved by Parliament and if taken into consideration the requirement for public engagement as well as improvements to the existing system, it is doubtful that the GST could be implemented this year. He said this in the 98th Laporan Kewangan Rakyat LKR release today. Tengku Datus Rizafrul noted that the national revenue collection as a percentage of a gross domestic product GDP last year was relatively low at 15.1%, compared with other countries in the region such as Singapore, Thailand and the Philippines. Tax revenue, meanwhile, stood at 11.2% of GDP. Hence, he said the government needs to make efforts to broaden its revenue base in order to distribute it in a more meaningful manner via development programs that will benefit all of Kluarga Malaysia, the Malaysian family. Air Asia Aviation Group Limited, AAAGL, the aviation arm of Capital A Group, has reaffirmed its commitment to resolve all refund requests caused by the ongoing effects of the pandemic as soon as possible. AAAGL Airlines, in a statement today, said they have already finalized over 99% of all customer queries and will work towards progressively settling the final 0.8% in the coming months. The two medium to long haul affiliate airlines Air Asia X and Thai Air Asia X also have firm plans in place to compensate all guests affected by the unprecedented flight disruptions over the past two years due to COVID 19 within the coming months. Capital A Group Chief Executive Officer Tony Fernandez said that Air Asia Airlines have already paid back to nearly everyone affected. The statement said Thai Air Asia X was similarly affected by the pandemic and is also working hard to settle all outstanding gas entitlements in the near future through refunds and credits. To date, the majority of all affected guests have received their travel vouchers, totaling over 155,000 guests. Air Asia Aviation Group Limited aims to complete the issuance of all remaining travel vouchers within the coming weeks. The Immigration Department will establish a special team comprising immigration officers that will focus solely on the approval of online passport applications and renewals in Klang Valley. Immigration Department Director General Datu Sri Khairul Zaimi Daud said the decision was taken as part of efforts to overcome the issue of congestion at immigration offices following the drastic increase in passport applications and renewals. Explaining further, he said the officers would be stationed at the immigration offices in Klang Valley next week. This came after its implementation in Johor Bahru recently showed effectiveness in speeding up the process, thus reducing congestion at immigration offices and counters. 
pada minggu hadapan uh, saya sedang mengumpulkan uh, pegawai daripada uh, negeri lain untuk dibawa ke kawasan uh, Lembah Kelang dan uh, selain daripada itu juga uh, saya sedang kaji uh, bagi mereka yang berusia 70 ke atas uh, mungkin mereka boleh menggunakan gambar yang sememangnya telah, telah pun berada di dalam sistem tidak perlu upload gambar baru ini antara penambahbaikan yang akan kita laksanakan untuk uh, menjadikan proses untuk nak melulus ini cepat tetapi apabila terlalu ramai datang uh, itu yang menjadi lambat Yesterday, Datu Sri Khairul Zaimi said passport applications and renewals have increased by 65%, causing unusual congestion at immigration offices, especially in the Klang Valley. The Immigration Department has busted a syndicate that has been making money from the government's labour recalibration program RTK. Immigration Department Director General Datuk Sri Khairul Zaimi Daud said two raids were conducted on 8 June in Kuala Lumpur and Ampang by its Intelligence and Special Operations Division, with six individuals arrested. According to Datu Sri Khairul Zaimi, the syndicate was masterminded by a 42-year-old Bangladeshi holding Malaysian permanent resident status. The man was arrested with his Malaysian wife at the first premises in Kuala Lumpur, while another local woman and her Bangladeshi husband were arrested during the second raid in Ampang. He said the modus operandi of the syndicate is to set up a construction company and an illegal employment agency to hide from the authorities and convince customers for the recruitment of foreign workers, especially under the RTK program by charging between 3,500 ringgit to 4,200 ringgit per application. Also arrested were two Bangladeshi men who were suspected of acting as intermediaries between the company and the customers. Sejumlah 488 naskah pasport antarabangsa telah berjaya dirampas iaitu terdiri daripada 457 uh, pasport Bangladesh, 8 pasport Indonesia, 8 lagi pasport India, 8 pasport Pakistan, 6 ialah pasport Myanmar dan 1 naskah pasport uh, Nepal. Pasukan serbuan juga turut merampas wang tunai sebanyak RM38,308 hasil daripada bayaran yang dikenakan dan turut dirampas ialah 12 cap syarikat dan 2 set komputer. segment, Russian forces advance into Protopopovka. Stay with us. Fifteen workers of Malaysian nationality were involved in an accident in Musdalifa, Saudi Arabia yesterday. Two of the individuals were confirmed to have sustained serious injuries involving bone fracture in the shoulder and neck, while the remaining 13 have been treated as outpatients and were discharged. Wisma Putra, in a statement today, said those involved are employees of a construction company involved in a track and railway service project in Makkah. Following the incident, they were taken to an -Nur Hospital and King Faisal Hospital in Makkah for treatment. The incident occurred when the bus they were riding in skidded and crashed. Further investigations are being carried out by the Saudi Arabian authorities regarding the incident. The statement added that the Malaysian Consulate General in Jeddah will continue to monitor the progress of the incident and provide appropriate consular assistance. The Foreign Ministry prays for the swift recovery of all victims involved. Thailand launched a campaign to give away 1 million free cannabis plants today, a day after decriminalizing its growth for commercial purposes. Authorities, however, had discouraged people from using it for the purpose of getting high and warned they could still fall foul of the law. Crowds were seen at a convention in northeastern Buriram province where the first 1,000 plants were being distributed. Visitors were also seen using the government's smartphone application Pluk Ganja or Grow Ganja with registration required for growing cannabis at home. 
Health Minister Anutin Chan Virakul discouraged recreational use of the plant. As he said, not to abuse it, do not just get high and do not use it and sit at home smiling and not getting any work done. He explained that these things are not part of their policies. Thailand legalized medicinal marijuana in 2018 for medical use but is now banking on developing it as a cash crop and rebuilding a lucrative local industry. Rescuers pulled out a woman from a landslide site and evacuated 11 factory workers from flood in two separate rescue operations in South China's Guangdong yesterday after continuous heavy rain drenched parts of the province in the past two days. A rain-triggered landslide struck Xinyi County of Maoming City at around 5 a.m. on Thursday morning, burying several residents in mud and debris. Firefighters rushed to the site and used a wooden board to cover a trapped woman before digging by hand through the mud to free her. After a 30-minute operation, the woman was pulled out and sent to hospital for treatment. Also yesterday, a massive flood hit Zhuhai city with water reaching nearly one meter deep in some places, trapping 11 workers from a local factory. Firefighters were dispatched to the site and reached the workers by rubber boats. All 11 workers were brought to safety after two hours of evacuation operation. Russian forces have crossed the Seversky Donetsk River and entered the community of Protopopovka. According to Russian Defense Ministry spokesman Igor Konashenkov, Russian troops yesterday continued attacks on military targets in Ukraine. He said Russian army engineers had started removing mines from roads and the forest belt of Sviti Gora National Park in Donetsk while eliminating 126 explosives planted by Ukrainian nationalists. High-precision air-based missile strike near Novograd Valinsky, Zhitome region, has destroyed one Ukrainian training center where foreign mercenaries were stationed. He also said Russian air defense systems shot down a Ukrainian Su-25 aircraft near Mazanovka of Donetsk. In total, 193 Ukrainian airplanes, 130 helicopters, 1,163 unmanned aerial vehicles, 336 anti-aircraft missile systems, 3,471 tanks and other armored combat vehicles were destroyed since the beginning of the special military operation. A further 493 multiple rocket launcher systems, 1,834 field artillery and mortars, as well as 3,512 units of special military vehicles are also added to the tally. In sports, Salah wins PFA Player of the Year award. Stay with us. Ahead of the Group E 2023 Asia Cup qualifiers clash between Malaysia and Bahrain, national head coach Kim Pangon expects only victory from the Harimau Malaya squad despite facing the prestigious team from Bahrain tomorrow night at the Bukit Jalil National Stadium. Pangan explained that he respects the opposing team, which are currently ranked 89 in the world and is also a dominant force in the Asia Cup campaign. However, Pangan may be keeping an ace up his sleeve and he did not disclose the strategy that he has chosen to face Bahrain, be it offensively or defensively. The coach also said the moral state of the team is at its highest in a while, especially after their win over Turkmenistan as well as all players currently free from injury. Pangon is also counting on the presence of Harimau Malaya supporters tomorrow to ignite the spirits of his boys. We have our own way to choose to win. So we will be consistently uh, to keep our way to fight. A different way, you know, this is we respect. We respect all.
And Dato Sri Ahmad Faisal said it would be improper to blame the National Football Development Programme, NFDP, for the under-23, under-23 squad's failure to shine in several recent international championships. He said all parties needed to understand that the objective of the programme was to uncover talent of international standards to be highlighted to football clubs in the country, and clubs were then supposed to polish these talents. Elaborating further on the matter, the minister said products from the Mokhtar Dahari Academy, AMD, have 100% marketability where they are snapped up and signed by clubs to play for them, which meant that it is the club's role to ensure that athletes have enough playing time. Dr. Sri Ahmad Faisal also believed, however, that clubs did not spoil talent from the academy. He also noted that if an athlete's performance drops, it is not right to point fingers at the coaches at AMD. After the under-23 squad finished fourth at the Southeast Asian Games last month, they were eliminated in the group stage of the 2022 Under-23 Asian Cup Championship in Tashkent, Uzbekistan, after losing their matches against South Korea, Thailand and Vietnam. In English football, Liverpool football superstar hailing from Egypt, Mohamed Salah, has won the Men's PFA Player of the Year award for the 2021-22 season. Salah won the award for the second time in his career. Being a Liverpool player since 2017, Salah had won the award before in 2018. The Reds also paid tribute to the 29-year-old player for his stellar achievement. The Egypt international fended off competition from Cristiano Ronaldo, Harry Kane, Virgil van Dijk and Sadio Mane to win the award. Salah scored 23 goals in his 35 appearances of the 2021-22 English Premier League with Liverpool, placing in second at its conclusion. Manchester City was crowned the 2022 champions after amassing 93 points in 28 matches, just one point above Liverpool with 92. Meanwhile, Manchester City's centre Phil Foden, age 22, won the PFA Best Young Player Award for the second consecutive year. Foden, who also won the award in 2021, scored nine goals across 28 English Premier League matches to help his team win the campaign. With the MERS 999 application system, getting emergency assistance is now easier. Save Me 999 Police connects the Malaysian public to the police. Save Me 999 Deaf for those with hearing or speech impairments. And Save Me 999 Blind for those with visual impairments. Download now for free on your smartphones. MERS 999 and applications make emergency calls easier. And wrapping up the news at 10, in our top story, government agrees to abolish mandatory death penalty. Tune in to updates at noon coming up at 12.30pm on TV2. Till then, it's Lights Out. I'm Brenda Paul. Thank you for tuning in and have a great weekend. Take care.